I usually run a calculator, not a microphone. Fair <laughs> um, Just to recap, I'm not sure everybody heard Dick, but we had three different perspectives on what we're talking about today. Randy did go over some of the pollutants that he sees. Uh, Lynette eloquently discussed what the EPA's position is regarding those pollutants and talked about how the EPA is looking to the city of Finley to start policing some of this and the MS4 permit process that goes along with that. Megan then talked about some of the things that the city of Finley is putting in place. One of those is going to be keeping track of construction projects. Now, all three of them talked about one pollutant in particular, and that's probably the one that I'll discuss the most, and that is sediment control. Randy talked about the pollutants that are in sediment. <coughs> Lynette talked about the NPDES permit which we file all the time for construction projects that are one acre or more. And Megan, I'm assuming at some point, will join the EPA and the city's department will be reviewing the NPDES permits and applications and also doing some inspections on the construction projects. So what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about what we typically try to implement on construction projects to make sure that our clients stay compliant with the MPDES permit that we're currently submitting to EPA. And I'll start with something simple. It's grass. A lot of people don't think about this as being a sediment control device, but I do. Um, vegetation of any sort is better than bare ground. Also, you'll note that I'm the least equipped to deal with PowerPoint presentations. Theirs are a lot better than mine. Here we have on one side a controlled site, on the other side uh, you can see the, the boundary between obviously the side on the right is going to produce more sediment than the side on the left. Now you get into a, a fine line between managing a, a construction project and trying to keep grass and vegetation everywhere. And we understand that there's a line there and there's something that makes economical sense as well. What we try to avoid is sediment going down into the catch basin. This is one of the ways we can do it. Uh, this, this is a construction entrance at Donnell School. Um, and I'm gonna just kind of point a little bit at some of these to get a little bit of better perspective, but I don't know if you can see it from back in the back, but this is a fairly large aggregate. What we'll do is put a construction drive down, put typically number two stone down, and when you're driving construction equipment over to exit the site, a lot of the mud, dirt, gets knocked off. The, the section is typically 18 inches, so it allows for a lot of sediment absorption. Uh, if there's maintenance that needs to be done on the construction drive, it's a relatively easy process. You see, this is on the back side of that. This is right at the street. Uh, unlike some of the other sites that we see, there's not a lot of sediment that's entering the street and the gutter that's going to get washed into the storm sewer. <coughs> this is another one that I'm sure a lot of you have seen on construction projects. Uh, sediment fence or sill fence is kind of commonly called. This is a fairly typical installation here. You'll see it a lot on the perimeter of projects. This one in particular it is nice because it has a little bit of a vegetative buffer. But it's essentially a woven <coughs> plastic or fabric mesh that will allow water to penetrate it, but picks up a lot of the larger sediment particles. Uh, proper installation, like, like all these controls, is key. Uh, if you don't put it in right and water is allowed to flow underneath the medium, it's not really accomplishing anything. So it needs to be staked in an adequate uh, distance. It needs to be put below grade. Uh, it needs to be inspected after rain events. The, the proper placement of this is going to be perpendicular to flow. So in this particular case, water would need to be flowing perpendicular to the silt fence. We don't want this thing following a contour or, or a slope to allow water to run down. Uh, if, you're, if your water is running parallel to the silt fence, it's not controlling anything. Now, contrast to that to this example. Uh, well. This is the last line of defense. This is, a, this is a bigger picture of that sill fence. So you can see the disturbed site a foot away from 
the silt fence if it wasn't there you're right on the other side of line street every time it rains you're, you're looking at a disaster from an assessment standpoint in the street now contrast that to this solution this one is on the top of the slope uh, anybody who's been frustrated by not trying to cross or trying to cross 95 over I-75 lately knows the bridge is now open so this this is a stabilization measure that is actually protecting the slope here what you see is this uh, slope drain takes all the runoff from the road dissipates the flow through the straw bale and runs it down towards this uh, plastic tile the plastic tile then conveys it down the hill you can see the tile runs down the hill, hits the swale, put a nice big bend in it to slow the velocity even further, and it's, then it's hitting the swale and it runs down to some more sediment fence that's connecting uh, the, or protecting the drainage structure to the pond. Now, if this was not in place, the runoff from the road would hit the slope, go past the guardrail, and run down the hill. Now, it is vegetated, or starting to be vegetated, but until that is established, Every time it rains, you'd see a significant amount of erosion on a slope like that. So you're looking at the slope drain control, and you're looking at the velocity control, the conveyance, and then finally the, the third part is the protection. And you can see that this is actually functioning pretty well. You can't even see the bottom of this. Now, at some point, this is going to need to be cleaned up. But you can see where the water is ponded on the sediment fence protecting the outlet. So in my opinion, this one's working pretty well. Now let's talk about inlet filters a little bit. Um, you know, I've seen the guy dumping the paint down the street, and uh, people, a lot of people think this stuff goes to the sanitary sewer, like Randy said. Inlet protection <coughs> is one that we, we very commonly use. Here you can see, uh, in addition to the placards, this casting is actually stamped so that uh, people can see that there's a fish in and that it is connected to the river. Um, again, unprotected catch basin. Now, this is, a, this is sort of a cut sheet from a product that we've started to use. I'm not trying to advertise for anybody, but I think it's a good product. This uh, hangs in the catch basin structure. I'm not sure how well you can see from the back, <coughs> but these clips hang onto the rim of the catch basin. So the top of the catch basin sits on here. The basket then is again a woven structure that allow water uh, uh, to pass through, but will not allow sediment to pass through. The other function that I like about this, and Megan talked a little bit, and Lynette talked a little bit about the first flush. Um, I get concerned when we're putting storm management practices in place that don't allow for advance for larger storms. This particular product does that. I get this pointer to work again. First flush storms are going to all hit the basket. When the larger storm event occurs and the flow rate is exceeded over this basket, water can pass over the top of the rim and go down in the storm structure again. This is a photo. Uh, this is uh, one we call for on our swift plan out of Mount Elm, the south of the street. So back there, if you can see, this is the frame structure sitting inside the catch basin. This is supposed to hit, sit up on the gutter. Get a little bit closer, you can see that weir, which is important for uh, larger storm events. And then get a little bit closer, and you can see how effective this product is. Not just leaves, but a lot of sudden. <coughs> Lynette also talked a little bit about some of the detention requirements. Some of, some of you look at detention ponds and this is a little bit difficult to see in the slide, but this is probably about six to eight feet deep here. People look at them as sources of fill material that we might need for a site. Uh, others look at them as uh, detention sources. <coughs> and, and the third function that, that uh, these things work for is our water quality design. Now, this one was just installed. This grass is barely growing. It's a little rugged looking. But this pond actually serves all three of those purposes. We've got uh, fill material for the soccer and softball fields. Uh, we're meeting the detention requirements for the city of Finley to the 100-year level. And we're also um, 
provide a high quality. <coughs> Economics are, are always driving it. We, we need to take a look at how we can put in place these uh, BMPs, have it be as effective as possible, but still not be doing more than we actually need to do to satisfy the EPA. Uh, let's take a little closer look here. And when we talk about slope control, you can see here some of the erosion that's occurring before the grass is fully established. In the bottom of this pond, this is the inlet of the pond. So <coughs> here we have riprap in the bottom. You already have sediment that's starting to settle into this pond. If we didn't have an outlet control in this pond, this stuff would already be into the river. Now this little device right here is called a skimmer. And we typically have it connected to what, what we're calling in our office sort of our water quality control outlet. Because of the advent of these regulations, we're, we're having to get a little more sophisticated with our storm designs. We're, we're incorporating sediment storage volume. We're incorporating water quality. And on top of that, we're still needing to meet outlet control requirements to the city of Finley. And, at this, and then at lastly, we need to meet flood control. So, we calculate based upon the tributary acreage for the site where our quality volume storage will be. It's a little bit closer look. Coming out of the outlet structure, we're going to have a severely reduced outlet. In some cases, it might be a few inches in diameter. What we'll do is connect up a flexible pipe to this device so that the pipes that are on the outside will cause this to flow. As the storm uh, water level rises in the pond, the skimmer will float. Now you know, you're walking in a, in a pond, you know, you get that squishy feeling between your toes. That's the sediment. The sediment settles to the bottom. So it would make sense then that if, as we're trying to draw down the tension volume, that if we can extend the detention time for the storm water that's in that pond and give it some time for the sediment to settle to the bottom, we're taking some of the pressure off the outlet, keeping some of that sediment in the pond. This is a device that I think works fairly well for that because it allows us to, over 24 or 48 hours, take the water from the top of the pond. And as that water level drops, we're just continuously taking the water off the top. The black pipe is the uh, restricted outlet that allows us to meet the outlet rate requirements for the city of Finley for the 100-year storm. Now you can imagine back before some of these requirements were put in place from the MBDES side, what that sediment contributing to the stream would look like if that pipe was at the bottom of the pond and not our restricted outlet. It'd be a significant increase in sediment that's released. What do you have? That, you know, the downside from the owner's side, you do have some maintenance involved. You need to get in there periodically and clean out the bottom of the pond. But as the site is controlled, as you get grass and other controls on the site, your maintenance drops off. When we talk about flood control, the staged outlet, we have the outlet for the required outlet rate from the city of Finley, and then we also have, once we get above the 100-year storm level, we have another catch basin up top at a different elevation that would allow water to go in and over the top of it. And if there is a structural failure, a basketball or something plugging the outlet, there beyond that catch basin, there is an overflow weir for the pond for flood routing. Now we'll, uh, we'll get into an example that, that we're working on at Don Alice, one Dick alluded to. This one's an underground detention system. We've been using uh, this system for years. I think it works pretty well. Underground detention is typically used where other methods aren't feasible. You may not have the space to do it. Uh, parking premium <laughs> land costs sometimes drive underground detention rather than putting a big hole in the ground like we used out by the baseball fields. Uh, in this particular case at Donnell, we did have a uh, green space, uh, those of you that know the site, on the east side of the property, but it was important to the school board and to the neighbors that they maintain that area as a parking area, an open space for the neighborhood and for the kids. So one of the solutions that we looked at was putting in this underground detention system. Um, 
on the back side of this, the picture that you were looking at was all this filter fabric laid out and ready to be laid on top. Essentially, the underground detention system is a large excavated area. This is about three feet deep. We backfill that with stone. It's, it's again, it's a fairly large aggregate because what we're looking for in the aggregate is the void region. We typically get about 35 to 40% void region. So we're storing water in the aggregate that's actually supporting the system. So you excavate, you backfill with stone. Here you can see the beginning of the installation. These are how they're delivered. And this guy right here is forcing them around all by himself. So they're not really that heavy. You don't need heavy equipment to put them in place. <coughs> Keeps the construction cost down. This is a cross section of some of the products and I think there's some mini versions over there. Here you're looking at one of the arch pipes. This has the outlet on it. These are end caps that snap into place. Again, maybe this is a little bit better picture for the aggregate size that we're looking at. Now this is the other end of the photo. Yeah, that's my finger right there. <laughs> so I was kind of taking it from a perspective back here before see the limits of the excavation, you get a better picture here of the storm detention chambers that are being put in place. These will extend all the way to the limits of the detention. The filter fabric will get laid on top. All these are backfilled with stone, by the way. Same stone that goes in here. So we're using void region stone all the way across this cross section here. Put the filter fabric back on top and you're ready to backfill it uh, with earth, or you, we can put parking lots on top of it as well. I don't know, it's probably, I don't know, it's been 10 years, it's been a while out at uh, the Olive Garden, the IHOP, that site, that's got a significant amount of underground attention on it as well. Uh, the driving factor there wasn't, wasn't a play area, but economics cost of land. So back to the functionality of this, what we have here is a header tile, so we're collecting storm water from the site, routing it through the pipes and into all these chambers. The chambers will fill up uniformly and then dissipate down. And we, we have an underdrain system in the stone base so that we're able to take advantage of 100% of the void region volume. Now, from a water quality standpoint, for this project, we introduced a couple of chambers on this end. You can see the start of it right here and there's actually a long water quality structure that will be here. I'll show you the plan view of it in a couple of minutes, but what's going on on Donnell from a water quality standpoint is before any of the water enters the detention system, for first flush, we have weird structures, not weird like strange, weird with a weird that will control <laughs> low flow storms. So low flows are routed through the uh, water quality chambers. There's no outlet on these chambers. So the calculations have been done to determine the length of the chamber versus the inflow and the, the area that we're trying to serve and how long the water will sit in that chamber. So we're effectively trying to do the same thing underground in these chambers that we're doing with the skimmer. We're trying to let that water sit and let it settle the sediment location in this case because we really don't want sediment spread throughout the whole entire system. We want to clean control portions of the system. Now this is the, this is the uh, site after the installation is complete. <coughs> One of the goals of, that they wanted to do was replace the sediment basin that we had here to begin with when the site was first initiated uh, with a staging area. So. With, with relatively shallow cover on this system, you're able to drive trucks, store materials, and reuse the site while you're building the school. Uh, when that talked about NPDES plans, uh, this is one of the plan sheets for the underground detention system. It is also part of what our SWIFT plan was for this site because this underground detention system and the water quality components were integral to our solution for water quality to the site. 
Here, this yellow portion, are all the individual chambers that were being laid out on the site. These are inspection ports. These pink ones are the water quality structures that we put in place. You can't see it on this sheet, but right here is a structure, here's a structure, and these lines go off onto the site. Stormwater comes into this structure, which I've highlighted down in here, and you can see that water coming into here is blocked from going to the other chambers. It goes through this pipe and into the water quality structure. Under high flows, it can go up and over this weir and get into the storm detention chambers. And as we work towards <coughs> water quality controls, it's equally as important that we convey large storm waters. I'm sure they've seen uh, filter wrapped catch basins that, that someone is intending to control sediment with that end up causing a flooding problem. Or I've, I've seen them months and months later growing grass out of the top because nobody's gone back and done what the maintenance required. So again, this is, this is just a cross section so you can see we've got stone medium underneath, stone backfill, pavement and or stone on top, and then in this particular case, grass on top. Now this is uh, the final slide, and this is kind of the, the culmination of what we submit to the EPA and what EPA and Megan will be reviewing and inspecting. The contractor is responsible for taking this plan view of our SWIFT plan and implementing a lot of the structural controls that we've already talked about. So this little candy track region right here is a new Donnell school. And I'm kind of highlighted not showing up real great some of the color differences here. Some of the structural controls that we specified for this project and provided details for them. Number one, you've got the grass buffer. Although not very wide, we tried to maintain it as, as much as possible around the perimeter of the site. Then you have the installation of the sediment fence. We put that anywhere where we're gonna be changing the grade and might be having some runoff that would be trying to exit the site. Um, it is not meant to be a device that handles a large surface area. So you can see some of these areas here where we have sediment fence. We also have in the large areas a sediment basin. So the water can be routed to the basin and it can sit again for that extended detention time before it leaves and heads to the public storm sewer. So we had one here, we had a smaller one over here. We actually had one over here that doubled as the excavation area for the underground detention system. The orange dots are the control structures. We talked about those water quality structures and weirs. These basins out front are close to construction entrances. We specified those inlet filters on them that I showed you earlier. The pink stripe right here is the construction entrance. There's multiple ones on this site, but this is the one I took photos of. And then finally, this is where we're putting the underground detention on site. And then we include some details that will give uh, contractors some more specifics on the proper construction, installation, and then we put together in large part a lot of the information from the rainwater guide for proper maintenance throughout construction. 